majority of people are, are fearful of change. And that's basically what's happened. But when we look back at any type of job in any industry, there's evolution. Everything has changed. My father's first job was a pin setter at a bowling alley. So he actually set up every single pin after someone bowls. Okay, we don't need that anymore. Or a lamp lighter or, you know, there's all of these jobs that I'm sure in those generations, yeah, they were fearful that their job was going away and was being taken over by the next innovation. It's making us more efficient and we'll get through this. I mean, I feel like there's always already been some calming down of after ChatGPT, especially in the copywriting world. A lot of people that I worked with thought, okay, I need to update my resume and go out and find a new job because we're done, we're obsolete, but definitely not the case. It's just changing how we do our work and what services we offer. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome everyone to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today we're talking with Jody Carey. Jody says in her LinkedIn profile, you can call me a copywriter or content writer or the person you need when you need words. Words that help you educate your audience, sell your product or service, and share your expertise. It's a great summary, Jody. I love it. You are based in Minneapolis in Sydney, Australia. She helps clients on both sides of the globe. She's been a contributing writer, staff writer, and senior content writer at many organizations, such as Schneider Electric and Engage. Finally, she's a guest speaker at Eden Prairie Public Schools, where she speaks with students in entrepreneurship and writing classes about marketing and copywriting. Thank you, Jody, for being on the program today. It's great to be here. Thanks, Justin. Awesome. Great. Well, since the overlap of generative AI and you know content writing or copywriting has taken the world by storm since the release of ChatGPT, I'm thrilled to have an expert copywriter like yourself on the program. And we'll get to many of these questions and really love to dive into your perspective and how it's been changing your career. But maybe for our listeners, maybe you could talk a little bit about the path of your career. It seems like maybe you've always wanted to be a writer. Yeah, I always enjoyed writing in school. My favorite thing was to do the research reports that most students hate to do. But I never had a teacher or anyone tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, I really think that you should go into journalism or English major or go on to write. But it was always something that I, I enjoyed doing. So I ended up going to school and getting a degree in marketing. And I've always done marketing as a career. And then I took some time off with raising my kids. We ended up moving to Australia and found that I had a lot of time on my hands. And a web developer asked me to do the content writing for his website. And that's where my love of writing was reignited. And I realized how much I enjoyed it. It's very cathartic. It's a creative process that I enjoy, but it also requires a bit of structure and research and organizational skills. So it was perfect for me and doing it as a freelance creative, I could fit it in with all of the school activities. And so, yeah, I've been doing copywriting exclusively for nine years. Nine years. Okay. Out on your own. And yep. you said you lived in Australia. Is that sort of how you've been able to, did you find some customers and some some clients there, it seems like? Yeah, that's where I started my copywriting business. And because Australia is a very small market and we were in a small town just outside of Sydney, it's really easy, I thought, to start a business there. I didn't realize it would happen so quickly, but people want to use professionals and businesses that are local. They really value that. So it was quite easy. And then just word of mouth, it took off. Good. And so this was nine years ago. And I'm, I'm sure we've seen a lot of changes in the industry. I, you know, before the advent of like generative AI, you know, there's always been sort of pieces of that. I mean, people maybe know or don't know, but, you know, this is GPT-4 that just came out, you know, earlier this year. And so, you know, there's been four iterations. It's been around for quite some time, but it really wasn't until it sort of hit the market, I think, when anybody could start using ChatGPT3, where it was like, aha, you know, this is, this is a very, very interesting. Had you seen any changes leading up to that at all? Or did it kind of hit you like a tsunami? Yeah, it felt like a tsunami definitely last November. But now that I'm using it and I'm realizing what generative AI is all about, I've been using generative AI and other tools, but didn't know that it was called that. 
So, you know, I use Grammarly and mm. Loom and other things where they're using different AI tools. And those have been around for copywriters for several years, if not, you know, almost 10 in different formations. And we use them all the time and we love them. You know, I don't can't think of a copywriter that who, who doesn't use Grammarly or I use something called um, Natural Reader. So it reads my content back to me. And uh, Word and Google, they do the same thing, but that the voice is very robotic. Yeah. And so now we can see over the past 12 months that all of these tools that we've been using are now incorporating more AI functionality and it's making the product better. So I can have my writing read back to me in you know, a journalistic way or a child's storybook way or a newscaster way or, you know, just different tones of voice, which really makes a difference when you're writing because we can take out a lot of second guessing and just are able to write more confidently and more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You're right. I have been using Grammarly for a number of years. I wish I had found it, you know, much earlier, actually. It saved my bacon so many times. And I think Coming from, you know, I'm an engineer. I don't really write a whole lot. Writing has been a chore for me, but I have a lot of respect for people that take the discipline of it and sort of focus time on doing that. I actually did a writer's workshop at the University of St. Thomas last January. I'm going to do it again this January. And since I'm an adjunct there, I get a chance to work with the English professors that are there and they will go through my stuff and, you know, edit it, give me feedback. But the biggest thing that they do is they actually hold me accountable. That's what's kind of fun about this writer's workshop. There's so much stuff you're supposed to get done each day, and you kind of have to report at the beginning of the day and the end of the day of what you did. How do you keep yourself accountable? Well, the deadlines, <laughs> clients holding okay. me account- okay. accountable for deadlines really makes a big difference. I mean, I've never written a book, but I can see how that could drag on for years and years and years unless you have a very specific deadline. So the copywriting work that I do is website content. So they have a launch date that we have to meet or their blogs and articles that have publication dates that they have to meet. So yeah, the deadlines definitely help keep me accountable. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And you talk about the robotic voices. You know, I I actually found an interesting tool that I think is called Descript, but it basically allows you to type words and then it'll actually read back what you've written. And the voices are amazing. Like, you know, it, it made me think I could turn a lot of these well, I am actually starting to turn blog posts into podcasts. Mm. Have you have you seen tools like that? Yeah, there's there's a lot of tools out there. And right now, I think it can be a little bit tricky because there are so many tools and a lot of them cost money and take a bit of mm. time to learn. So we can jump down that rabbit hole of all of the tools and the shiny new objects in front of us. What I am most excited about with the introduction to public of uh, mainstream generative AI is that it is opening the doors of communication to everyone in so many different ways. So when I was growing up, my grandfather was completely blind. So I remember him going, calling on the phone actually, and listening to the newspaper being read to him. And it was a very, very robotic, monotone voice. But that was the only way that he could consume that information. But now, you know, you can tap and hover over a website and it'll read it back to you. And you can change the voice or change the accent. So just thinking about in that 40-year time, how far we've come for people who have different learning styles and different abilities in how they consume information It's revolutionary. I mean, I think it is absolutely fantastic. And I'm interested to hear what you're experiencing. Do you think that people are as afraid of it as they were a year ago? Like the people on the street or people, because, you know, we did that AI town hall together. People were pretty optimistic at the beginning of the town hall. Yep. And I think people haven't used it enough to be blatant. I think I still find people that are not using ChatGPT. In fact, I just talked to one of my employees today and he was like, I'm struggling with this problem. I'm like, ask ChatGPT, right? It doesn't come off of people's thoughts right away. They maybe might run a Google search or might, you know, dig through some stuff. But I found myself having to train myself to be like, no, I'm going to actually go over here and start asking this AI buddy is what I kind of call it. But this thing that can basically help me where is, is needed. Now, 
All that being said, you know, I think it definitely is a generational thing, right? The younger people are sort of picking it up faster. People that it really is impacting what they're doing, I would say probably, you know, college students were the first ones to jump on this and start using it or anybody who is basically going to be writing stuff. But it's interesting, after doing that town hall, I actually did a, I was on a panel, there was four of us, and it was actually focused on marketers. And at the beginning, the moderator said, who who here has used ChatGPT? And I would say a minority of people's hands went up, probably 25 to 30% of the people actually raised their hand. And I was like, this thing's been out for almost a year when that was, and people hadn't actually really adopted it or started using it yet. So I still feel like people talk about it and they're like, oh, that's interesting. But then it never bubbles up to like actually being a part of their workflow. It might be something that they touch here and there. And then I think once people start using it, I think people find value in it. I think there's general happiness, but they probably aren't thinking the long-term consequences. Yeah. That's my perspective, I guess, that I'm sort of observing right now. And that's where I think the ethical debate happens. And that's where, you know, how could you use this for deep fakes and uh, all that sort of stuff, you know, occurs. And it kind of remains to be seen. But I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's a powerful tool. It's changed the way that I do a lot of things when it comes to writing and not only writing blog posts, but writing um, code software. It changes the way that I've actually written some emails. You know, it's given me good ideas. And for me, it helps solve that blank page problem. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And I think, you know, it felt like it hit my area like a tsunami because it is writing and it is the copywriting world. And then I have kids that are in school and the teachers were quite fearful of what does this mean and cheating and all of those things. But what's coming down the pipeline is so promising with Khan Academy and what they're doing to with the tutorials for teachers. What is their product called? I'll have to find it. But or even in the medical field. Mm. So Mm -hmm. I know that there's some work being done with physicians that are trying to create a database of all of the different diagnoses. And then therefore they can go into their version of ChatGPT and be able to diagnose much, much faster. So I feel like the efficiencies that are coming from the use of generative AI is, I think it's a positive. I really feel positive energy coming from it. Yeah, I was, I was looking up, is it called Conmingo, yeah, I guess? Yes, was, that's yeah. it. And we had an event here at Lab 651, like it was at the beginning of December. And we actually had somebody from St. Paul Public Schools who, who was here. She was interested in learning about what AI is doing sort of across industries. And it was cool because one of the people that was on the panel was sort of painting this picture, telling a story about, you know, imagine if you could actually create 30 different lesson plans for 30 different students in the classroom. And that is super powerful. And that's kind of what I think these, where you're getting at, you know, is what this tool does. It kind of creates lesson plans geared for each student, correct? Yeah, it does. Or the student can have it next to them and they're writing a research report. And then the chat GPT version of it will say, okay, well, what do you think about this part of it? Or what, what else can we look at as far as, you know, if we're talking about World War One or World War Two, like what are the inputs that caused this crisis in history. And then it's more of a two-way conversation with those students. And so you have 40 kids in a classroom. Obviously, one teacher can't help all of them. The other thing that I've been doing a lot of research about in the last year from a personal perspective is the way the learning styles, introverts and extroverts, and how we process information. So our classrooms are set up to raise your hand and ask a question and have those two-way discussions with the teacher. Well, I have a child who's a deep processor. And so therefore, he's not ready to respond until the next hour. Yes, so, yes. you know, a- kids are learning and processing at different levels. So if they can have their own little pocket teaching assistant next to them, being able to help work out these reports, I think that's fantastic. I think we'll leave less yeah. kids behind. Do you think so? I guess, you know, the, the, the fear that you would see from a teacher, for example, is, is, well, then why am I here anymore? Right. You know, if this thing's doing all the lesson planning, then then what's my role? Yeah, well, I mean, I think most teachers would be very happy to take some of the things off of their plate and and have some assistance in the classroom. Definitely, there's still a role, just like there's still a role for copywriters. You know, we still have to look at the big picture, the, the strategic part behind a project. So, for example, I use ChatGPT to help me with the research, like you said, you know, ask the questions and then I have it help me with the writing. So if I have to write something in a different tone of voice that maybe is not my natural speaking style, then I'll use it for that. And then I have it help me edit. 
at the end, how take out the passive voice or how can I make this more concise? But as you know, from using ChatGPT4, you put in some prompts, it's going to give you pretty much garbage. But Mm -hmm. you can use chunks of what it produces to create something in a more timely manner. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned about roles. Yeah, what popped into my head was, you know, people talked about self-driving trucks, right? And and actually, uh, Andrew Yang has an interesting book called The War on Normal People. But it talks about this whole idea. He has this universal basic income idea that everyone should get a universal basic income. But the thing that he sets up, though, is just this world in the future when you don't need truck drivers anymore, right? And how that's going to completely, you know, kind of ruin their their careers and their livelihoods. But it's interesting because once you actually dig into the research, most truck drivers don't want to drive that much, right? They, they actually don't want to have to drive across the country and be away from their family, you know, six days a week and everything. So people are all worried, you know, oh my gosh, these people are going to freak out. It's like, no, they, they actually would rather do the shorter routes, the smaller stuff. And that's still going to be able to be possible. Someone's going to have to unload these trucks too, you know? So it's one of these things where I think people can dial it so far one direction that you think it's going to be basically an apocalypse, but we're actually getting rid of some mundane work Absolutely. And I think majority of people are are fearful of change. And that's basically what's happened. But when we look back at any type of job in any industry, there's evolution. Everything has changed. My father's first job was a pin setter at a bowling alley. So he actually Mm. set up every single pin after someone bowled. Okay, we don't need that anymore. Or a lamp lighter. Or, you know, there's all of these jobs that I'm sure in those generations, yeah, they were fearful that their job was going away and was being taken over by you know, the next innovation, but it's making us more efficient and we'll get through this. I mean, I feel like there's already been some calming down of after chat GPT, especially in the copywriting world. A lot of people that I worked with thought, okay, I need to update my resume and go out and find a new job because we're done. We're obsolete, but definitely not the case. It's just changing how we do our work and what services we offer. But yeah, it's interesting times. I just, you know, and I look to at the photography world. This has happened with Photoshop. You know, we talk about the deep fakes. If you know Photoshop, you can make any picture any way you want it. It's just now generative AI is putting these tools in the hands of people that don't have Photoshop skills. And I think that's a little bit scary to people. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, some people say, well, it's different this time, right? It's one of these things where you can actually ask the tool how to use the tool. I've heard some people say, you know, that it's, you know, you can't ask a hammer. How am I supposed to use a hammer? But with ChatGPT, you can actually ask it. And it actually feels like it starts to nip at the creativity side that one of these, that a lot of these other tools haven't done in the past. I think you probably agree with that, but I think, you know, maybe I'd be curious to get your perspective. Yeah, I, I think that, well, I mean, we have to remember, too, that the the information that's going into the large language models are coming from humans. You know, unless I'm misunderstanding, you know, they're not creating their own content. It's just collating the content that's been already produced and redistributing it in a different way. So, yeah, I think the creativity part of it, that has to come from humans. It's just the the generative AI is collating everything for us in a different way. You know, the information that I get out from when I write a piece, it's laughable. I mean, the things that it comes <laughs> up with, nobody would ever publish, but at least it helps get you to that next creative idea. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that don't do the human in the loop, right? The human still needs to edit and make sure that everything's being written correctly. And so, yeah, as it stands right now, you still need to have that component to it. So imagine going back and going through school, I guess, you know, and like, what if you had this tool today or what if you had this tool back then? That's what I'm saying. You think you'd leave school with the same, I guess, amount of mastery, I guess, or discipline or Do you think it would change much, you know, net positive, net negative, you know, kind of net neutral in copywriting? Yeah, no, I think I would have been further ahead. So I'm in the place where I have my youngest son is a senior at high school. And so a lot of memories come back. It's a lot of, well, in my day, well, when we were doing (laughs) English, you know, and it's a lot of reflection of how we did it, you know, in the 90s versus how he's doing it now. And I think about 
writing a research report in high school, going to the library, going to the card catalog, finding these books and pamphlets and magazines and hoping that there's something about the topic that you're looking for. And then having to type it, you know, and and when I was in junior high, we're using the correction tape and having to go back. And then the other thing is the bibliography, how many hours I spent making sure that, you know, the references were correct. And then you'd get marked off if there wasn't a comma in the right place. I mean, what a waste of time, (laughs) you know? Very true. And so now you just put in, here's my source, come up with the Chicago style bibliography, done. I mean, those are not skills that any of us need mm-hmm. other than maybe True. attention to detail. So, no, I think that, you know, what my kids are going through as far as setting them up for the working world, they are much further ahead. They're much smarter. They're more resourceful. They're more worldly than I feel like my generation was. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, no, for sure. And again, not having lived in the copywriting world and having to write a bunch of stuff, the only stuff that I've touched is is Grammarly. Like I would say, that has basically been really, really good. Although it's still not perfect. Sometimes, you know, it, it changes words to different stuff. And I'm like, I don't really like the way that that reads and I just overwrite it, you know? But I would say a lot of times... I just kind of hash out an email and then I go through and I go click, 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 fix, you know, fix. So it's definitely helped me in that. And then from a software development standpoint, it's been really interesting. You know, if I think back to it's the same sort of concept, well, before the internet, good luck, right? Actually trying to figure out code, you know, again, it's, there was, it was all just books. It was the same thing. You're sort of flipping through. Am I missing a semicolon somewhere or how does this function work? And then even with the internet, documentation can be very, very poor, you just are scouring, you know, open source websites and open source projects and other stuff to find little bits of code that people have done that's like, oh, that's how you did it, right? And a lot of, you know, definitely a lot of in-person, I guess, and this, maybe this is pre-COVID days too, a lot of sitting down with other engineers and having them talk through the code in terms of what it did. And, you know, now you can ask it to not only write the code, which isn't too bad, but the best thing that I've found is that it actually helps you document the code. You can actually say, how does this work? And it will actually give you back reasonable explanations on what pieces of code are doing. So, yeah, I think software developers coming out, I have heard some of them say, and it probably would be analogous potentially to copywriters, is they're like, well, I want to figure out how to do it the old school way. So, like, it, it sinks in, and then I'm going to use the AI tool. And I'm like, well, to each their own, I guess. But, you know, I certainly wouldn't take that approach, but that's what some people say. So do you think that there's a need for less programmers in the future because you can create code in generative AI? That's an interesting question. I think the mundane work of just somebody that's just going to sit there and type out a bunch of things, absolutely. That is what is typically called boilerplate code, you know? AI should be able just to dump that out for you right away. But I also feel like we're going to need to write more code as an industry. It's the same thing. Like, you know, there's not going to be less farmers per se. Everyone just needs to become more efficient, but the population is still growing. So we need to grow more food. (laughs) And so I feel like, you know, there's going to be more code that's going to need to be written. And certainly the tasks are going to be changed. So they're going to be focused more on people that can architect. You talked about strategy. That's what's going to be important is somebody that can basically architect a software system the right way and figure out the strategy for it. And then they might fling it off to some AI or a bot to write a lot of the stuff. And then again, I view computer programming language as just another language, just like French, just like Italian, whatever it is. Somebody needs to still needs to review it and be like, is this really doing the right thing? Are there bugs introduced? How do we test this? And so it still needs to be kind of be fact-checked and sort of run. But, you know, at the pace in which software is being generated, you know, I, I don't even know the, the stats, but my guess is, you know, next year we're going to generate twice as much software as we did the year prior. And the next year, you know, probably five times more. The next year, 10 times more. So it's just this exponential curve of software needs to be written and more and more systems need to be built. And I believe we need these tools in order to actually be efficient and effective as an industry. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it sounds like for both, you know, your industry and mine, we're just almost taking out that entry level job. And I mean, to be quite honest, what they're teaching the kids at university now is beyond entry level jobs anyway. So, yeah, I think we're we're advancing in a in a good way and like you said, taking out those mundane jobs that no nobody really wants to do. 
Yeah. I think if you are going into the industry, no matter what the industry is, and your intention is, is just to sort of stay at the bottom of the ladder, you know, not actually try and advance as quickly as possible, then you're probably in the wrong industry. So anyone that's coming out of school thinking, well, I'm just going to write a bunch of code, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're actually supposed to be thinking intelligently about how you can pull together various systems and engineer a solution. And so, yeah, that's the mindset you have to have coming into this industry. And if you keep that in forefront of your mind and you continue to learn newer and better ways to build things, then I think you will have a career for sure going forward. Yeah. And I also think, you know, I've focused on software, but I just, I think there's a lot of time, at least that I spend just responding to emails. And I've been thinking more and more about that. Like, you know, Google has ways that they have claimed and with their latest project, their Project Gemini, it's going to be really interesting there are going to be a days in the next year, I believe, where I won't even need to respond to these emails, actually. There's going to be select ones that I'm going to train certain ways, and they will just happen. And it's, it's going to save me a lot of time. I literally open up my email at the beginning of the day, and I, I was thinking about this today. My joke is, is, you know, the moment you open up your email, someone else's problems become your problems, right? That's the way it is in my industry. Somebody needs me to do something, right? So the moment I open up my emails, I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, here's the stuff that I need to do. And so I spend the first X number of minutes or hours, whatever it is, responding to stuff. And I can't wait for a day when that is just off my plate and I'm more in solutioneering, you know, and building new things rather than having to spend a lot of time with my fingers typing responses. Yeah, I mean, if you think about how the retail world, especially online retail world, is doing that with the chat bots, you know, they take those frequently asked questions and take that out of the queue for an actual person to respond to. And it just generates that. Yeah, I think yeah. we're almost there. Yeah, absolutely. We get so tied down with the the little details that you're right. You can't work on the big picture projects. And then you, by the end of the day, you don't have the brain capacity to even focus on the strategic stuff. So, yes. yeah, no, that's a good point. And, you know, thinking about email, too. And you know, I look at, again, my boys who they're just texting and chatting. And it is so hard to get this next generation to read their email and respond to their email and <laughs> the confidence is not there. They're like, what do you mean I have to write a full sentence? So, you know, putting that into chat GPT, I'm like, well, just write bullet points what you want to say and say, make this into an email. So the coaching part of it and the mentoring part of it, I really like to give people that confidence that they can write or if someone's asked to write a press release and they've never seen a press release in their life, there you go. In 30 seconds, done. And then you go in and edit and change it. But it, the template is there for you in a matter of seconds. Yeah. Have you played with any of the generative like uh, images, like tools, like Dolly or anything like that? No, I haven't. I don't do anything with um, graphics at all anymore. I, I mean, I've we used to do social media stuff. So I would do things in Canva. And I know that Canva now has their own generative, but no, I haven't. I know Photoshop, but I haven't done anything with the AI part of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's not a part of my major thing, but I, I have two boys as well. They're nine and 11, so younger ages, but we started playing around this weekend. It was interesting. We were at a restaurant and they love corgis. You know, they want really want to get a corgi dog and they love going out and Googling around for corgi photos. But I'm like, hey, why don't you ask ChatGPT to generate you a corgi, right? So they did that. And then it became this game. They were like, let's put a twins hat on it. And so it generated a twins hat. And then it was like, let's put it in the twin stadium. And it totally put it in target field in the center of there. And their mind just expanded and they created a whole bunch of different stuff. They were like, let's give it a six pack. So there was like this buff Corgi that was there. And so I was just laughing the whole time about what they, what they wanted to do. And then, you know, I, I will say this, I haven't even told people about this, but they, I, I think they said, make it have a sword or, or something like that. And the, I, it said, no, it basically said, I will not generate something that has violence in it. Right. So I was surprised the guardrails can be pretty tight on that. And so I was like, interesting, they're putting that stuff in. But it was it was really fun. And they had a chance to start playing around with some of the image generation. And I used it for that talk that we did in uh, Eden Prairie. All the images that I did were sort of generated out of that tool, which I think is very, very interesting. And I've seen some Photoshop things that are actually really cool around where people have been able to generate just, the, you know, put a bear in the picture right now. And it, it basically blends this real life looking bear, you know, in this camp scene. And we actually had somebody at our last conference who went through this whole thing. They also, they go out and do photo shoots. So they work with a customer that is in the agriculture thing and they need to go out and take pictures of them, you know, picking corn out in the fields. Well, no longer 
right? I mean, these photo shoots that could be $50,000 now, he can just do it in keystrokes, mm. you know, which is which was like amazing and really, really awesome. Really, really awesome, awesome presentation. Interestingly enough, sort of the end of that is, yeah, the lawyers decided that they didn't want to use it mainly because it's still ambiguous on who owns the content for some of these things that are generated. So do you have that content concern at all? No. Like ownership. No, no, I don't. It's so when I work with a content agency out of Australia and they do have guidelines for us so and how we can use ChatGPT so we can use it to get past the blank page we can use it for editing but we definitely can't just plug in information and then pump it back out so there are like you know you're saying that you can't put a sword in the picture there are guardrails going up from agency perspective all the way to the the software them itself but then what I do worry about is I do work with a client who has private information and I would love to take that content and put it in ChatGPT and have it edit. But somehow I'd have to take out all of the people's names and anything that could be maybe possibly recorded. So I don't use it with all of my clients if there is um, sensitive information that shouldn't be out there for the world to see. But I know that they, you know, they're getting around that too. So now companies are able to have their own generative AI that has some safety mechanisms installed. Yeah, yeah, it sort of stays within their own their own data center, so it's not ac- actually publicly available. You know, one thing that I was thinking of was this company that I mentioned that was doing these generative images of like real life photos. You know, of people out there they put together some guidelines very similar to I think you know what you're doing. Yes, you can use it here. No, you can't use it there. And you know, one of the things that they said is you cannot say in the style of so-and-so, right? He said that there's certain ways that images can be processed around, I think it's around like basically aperture, you know, like Mm -hmm. the way that the photo lens is basically set up, which is fascinating that you can tell it to change the aperture and it actually understands that and Mm -hmm. generates a different image based on that. But anyways, yeah, they can't say in the style of because that would actually be infringement. Like it actually would be generating something in this person's style and they're worried that 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 would be a, a lawsuit, you know, if you knew that you actually generated it following an existing style. Yeah, that's interesting because I've been listening to a couple of podcasts from people who are fiction writers, novelists, and that's been a big issue where their books have been uploaded without their consent. And so someone could go in and say, in the style of, and put an author in there, and then someone can Mm -hmm. just create their own story. So I think that that is a little bit of a worry for writers. It's not the type of writing that I do, but if you're into that creative fiction writing, there's really nothing to say that whose work it is and whose style it is. But in the copywriting world, you know, everything is specific to a client or a company. And a lot of the things that I do is I have to interview people. So generative AI can't interview people yet, or they can't like pull in that human emotion So to say, I want to write in the style of Ogilvy or some other type of advertising person, I mean, maybe it would work, but I mean, copywriting is all kind of the same anyway. But yeah, I think that creative part of it from either a graphic designer, a photographer, or a novelist, that can be tricky. So that's good to hear that they're saying you can't say in the style of. There's a guardrail Mm -hmm. that will help with all of this. Yeah. And again, it's, it was self-implemented, right, by themselves. But yeah, one of the things that they realized that they needed to make sure that whatever they generate doesn't follow these other things that someone else already has in the public domain that they own. Well, for people looking to get into the field, I guess, for people looking to start exploring with AI and copywriting tools, imagine somebody's coming out of school and say, I always kind of like to ask this of people that are on the program, kind of rewind back to when you were out of school. You know, is it just a matter of just start using this stuff or do you have other areas where you've gone or things that you've seen where you think somebody would be, it'd be valuable for somebody to? Yeah, I think in copywriting, yeah, there are a lot of books out there. There's a lot of online classes and things that you can do, but it seems like it's more about running a business, being a copywriter, or it'll give you some very basic information. Even in school, you're going to get kind of that high level overview, more academic So I recommend, this is what I tell my kids, is to go and work for somebody, either an ad agency or a big company where you have a marketing department or you have a PR department within the company 
that's where you're really going to learn the day to day and you're going to be able to see the results, the A and B testing and if it's pulling in sales and how it's driving the market. So that hands on experience, in my opinion, for content writing and copywriting is really important. So reading books and listening to podcasts will help, but you have Mm. to do it. You just have to dig in and do it. Totally, totally makes sense. Well, this has been awesome. It's been a great conversation. How, how do people find you? Reach out to you, Jody. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, Jody Carey, J O D Y C A R E Y, or I have a website, jodycarey.com. So those are the two best places. Awesome. It's been great. I, I always also like to ask is there anything we didn't cover? I guess, was there there's something specific you wanted to talk about that I, I think we covered a lot of stuff, but you know, obviously, if there was an area you wanted to focus on in the last couple of minutes we got here. No, I think we covered all of it. Yeah, there's. A lot going on in the last year and more to come in the years. Yeah, I guess maybe that's just one question. I guess if I interview next year, a year from now, what's your feeling? What do you think is going to have changed or or maybe hasn't changed? I think the tools will get better. We'll lose the hallucinating and the making up of facts or quotes just to fill the page or the word count. The research will be a little bit more in depth. Right now, I think there's a lot of repetition in what it says. So yeah, I think we'll just have a better, better product a year from now. That's probably, yes, I would definitely, definitely agree with that. I think we'll still be talking about a lot of these same things around, you know, how's it going to affect our lives and our future roles, but hopefully it'll be a little bit of a clearer picture, I guess. People won't be as afraid of it. And maybe that's what happens with new technology too, is just the more people start using it, adopting it into what it is, it's not as scary. Yep. Well, this is great. Again, Jody, thank you so much for being on the, the program today. I'll put links to a lot of the stuff that we talked through here. I should have mentioned that earlier, but yeah, we, we run through entire transcript and we have liner notes and everything like that. So I'll be sure to link off to your website, your LinkedIn, all that sort of stuff so people can find you. So when thanks. It? Thanks again. Thank you so much. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.